Yeah, definitely. I, I, I see that a lot. You know, people will might just read some statistics and assume that, you know, no one over 65 is on Facebook or using email. And, and that's really, it's really not true. It's just less of a percentage. And so to really understand where your audience is, is important. And, and I think the idea of switching up the communication just helps keep people out of out of a rut of, you know, everyone gets at some point is going to get too many emails. And so, you know, how do you then look at reaching out to people in a different way? So it's, it's sort of this mix of like, what is your, what are your audience habits, but also how do you keep it fresh so that you just stand out in their sea of communication, communication from others? You're listening to Relish This, the Purpose Marketing Podcast. Here's your host, Stu Swinefort. Hey everybody, Stu here with another great episode of Relish This. My guest today was Emily Taylor, and she is the principal at Teeny Big, and she helps nonprofit leaders turn lackluster followers into passionate supporters. So really doing some great work to talk through the audience engagement cycle. She calls it a pathway and how to create opportunities to escalate people's engagements. So once you've brought them into your organization, how do you get them to do more? How do you get them to to take that next step? Really being intentional about your messaging to attract and connect with really specific stakeholders. So not being wishy-washy, just just really focusing on how to get people to take that next step. It was a really fun conversation. We have a lot of commonality in terms of how we approach nonprofit marketing. I think you're going to really love this show. And uh, here we go. Emily, thanks for being on the show today. Thanks for having me, Stu. I'm glad to be here. Well, I'm really looking forward to our conversation. We appear to have a lot of overlap in the way that we think about nonprofit marketing. And and I know that you are an expert in helping nonprofits take their uh, kind of lackluster support and and really energize that and and get donors and and volunteers really excited about being part of of the uh, of the organization. Um, so I'd love to love to hear a little bit more about your your business and how you do that. And, and then we can talk some more about that engagement life cycle. Sure. Yeah. So I, I help nonprofits take their lackluster followers and turn them into passionate supporters and uh, really to build momentum for an organization to have, have uh, extra capacity so they can, you know, pull in volunteers, advocates, donors when they need them. Uh, but really, my philosophy is based around my background in human-centered design and, and really taking a look at what your organization looks like and means to uh, through your owners, or sorry, through your audience's eyes. Um, so that really informs a lot of the work that I do. Um, and I'm, I help nonprofits really make a plan for thinking about how they're engaging people and bringing them along a path so that they they do lead them to become those more passionate supporters that they need. Yeah, that's great. It sounds like it's almost part of our what we call our um, inspire phase, where people have kind of raised their hands and they're part of the team, but they but they've maybe gone away a little bit, and just all of those places where, as a as an organization who's really trying to do more good in the world, you can re-energize that that group. Um, you know, these people that are already knowledgeable about what you do and, and have, have maybe participated in the past to, to do more. Yeah. It's, it's like a, it's much like a pipeline, you know, even when you then motivate those people, how do you make sure you're still having people you don't even know yet fill in to that spot so you can then lead, lead them up. Yeah. It's like that escalation of engagement kind of approach. Yeah, a lot of people call it an engagement ladder. I've been using yeah. uh, engagement path and engagement map um, just because I think there's more layers we can add on to it as well to really mm-hmm. help guide us and not just, you know, ask people to do stuff, but really understand what they need to hear at the right time. 
Yeah, that's great. We I had a conversation with um, a guy from Next After the other day, and one of the things that he talked about was how you know there aren't a lot of people who wake up in the morning and say, "How can I give away some of my money today?" and um, and so in the nonprofit space, it's it's a little there are a lot more challenges, a lot more friction to overcome when trying to get people to, to really engage with your organization, there's, you know, it's not, I, I put money in as a, as a user and I get something out in terms of like a tangible physical, you know, thing that I'm buying, for example. So that whole idea of a funnel is kind of misconstrued in the nonprofit world. Um, it's more like a mountain because you have to keep pushing people up to these, you know, up past these little ridges of, of friction and to get them to the top where they then uh, become actual stakeholders. Yeah, I like that idea of a mountain. I, I typically heard ladder, which makes each piece sound very equal, but but it is more like a mountain where there's, there's different hurdles along the way. Well, what we've also found is that it's not necessarily linear, you know, and <clears throat> a lot of times you can actually, you know, there will be people who who are convinced from the get-go and they're like, I love it. I want to, I want to become a donor. I want to be part of this organization. And then other people require, you know, a lot more, um, you know, what we would call kind of sales touches in the, in the for-profit world, but, uh, but just a lot more convincing um, to take that, that leap. And they, people can lurk for a while before they, before they actually sign on. So it's, it's just really an interesting thing, I think for nonprofits in particular to be considering is just how, how much time and effort does it take to get someone to to actually engage and 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 be willing to to kind of ride that out yeah i was actually you know i was looking at some statistics on on just for profit companies that are using customer journey mapping and and things like that for for their own engagement and it just made me think of how you know all your audience is shopping their consumers as well as philanthropists and, and, you know, advocates of your organization. And so I think it's these, it said 34% of companies are implementing journey mapping right now this year. And so it just made me think of like how much consumers are getting used to that. And then as they shift over to their nonprofit world, they're, um, you know, they're not necessarily having that same staged engagement or that, that path to bring them along and they're not really feeling as part of the process. Um, but I think more and more people are getting, um, getting comfortable with that because, you know, companies like Starbucks and Uber, and, um, they are bringing people down a journey and gathering feedback from them um, and building that process to be very engaging. So I think nonprofits also have to figure out how they can deliver on those experiences as well. Yeah, it's really interesting. I think that you bring up such a good point there that people <clears throat> people become accustomed to how how to be sold to, and then when when something is breaking that kind of process that they're that they're ready to you know accept and and wrap their arms around it. It can also, I mean, that can actually be additional friction added to the added to the. Uh, relationship right there just because it's if if you're not following trends there's a potential that you're turning people off yeah they're just their habits that people get used to uh and and it's hard for them to break them yeah that's interesting so tell us a little bit more about the 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 journey the 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 mapping that you do what what's your process there sure so i i like to look um at you know, an engagement with an organization, um, something like when you learn a guitar, you know, when you first learn a guitar, um, you don't really know a lot about the instrument, but you kind of get excited by seeing a famous person play a guitar. If you want to learn Stairway to Heaven, um, but you, it takes some steps to you sort of have these different elements of excitement, but also really basics that you need to learn just to move forward and then start to understand more complex things, you know, all the way to then getting to appreciate, you know, different greats in the guitar world and, and maybe performing your own songs. And so in that same way, I think nonprofits kind of forget how complicated their, 
their work is. They've done it for a long time. They're so such experts at it that um, our first process is to like lift them out of that expertise for a moment so that we can look at like where are people starting caring about your organization? What are the, the hooks that bring them in? Uh, and what do they what are the, like the baby steps they need to know, those first notes or chords that help them get your organization? And then we um, we break it up into to stages and think about, you know, what what they then need to learn next to care a little more and a little more all the way up to whatever the most engaged um, they hope people to be. You know, that could be becoming a board member eventually or being put in put uh, the organization in their will, you know, just the highest level. And so we look at that as a whole and build in those baby steps along the way um, to, so that they know where they're guiding people towards. Yeah, that's great. So you're really looking at motivations and, and the triggers that can occur to transition someone from just a, you know, maybe a one-time donor to a, to a, a, a repeat donor to uh, like a super donor. Um, and then all the way up through volunteer opportunities or, or, inclusion in the board or, or getting them to inspire others to, to take part in that, um, in that journey as well. Yeah. And that's why, you know, it really, I talk about this as a map because it really helps to know the points along that journey. Cause once you know those points, you know, whether it's following you on Facebook and now you want them to make a small donation or come to an event, then we can take a look at, you know, that in between point and how do you motivate someone to get there? Um, right. And, there's actually uh, in, in human centered design, there's um, some elements we use uh, that are called jobs to be done. And so mm -hmm. um, we can look at functional jobs to be done and emotional jobs to be done. I also like to throw in cultural. Um, and what there really is, is like looking at what what do people need at that moment? What you know, there's sort of functional needs like they need to be asked. They need the information. They uh, might need some some statistics that that kind of show the motivation, but they also have some emotional needs like being might be being part of a, a bigger part of your mission. It might be, you know, joining a group of people with a similar um, passion for something. Uh, and, and when we really understand those needs and where people are at that point, it's easier to get them to that next point and guide them there. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I really like that idea of 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 being aware of of where people sit in their journey, and and understanding what what m the kind of typical next step might be, so that you can present that at the at the opportune moment. Are you recommending nonprofits engage with? any tools that can help them track this or what's your, what's your approach to getting people to understand what their, what their um, stakeholders journey might be? So I, I have a, a coaching program where I help guide them through this and we, we work through it together. Um, you know, we kind of pinpoint what they know about their audience. Uh, right. And then, and then comes the, the tricky part is usually once we've mapped that out, we realize there's a big gap somewhere. Um, you know, you can you can see this a lot in maybe organizations who have arts organizations who have a lot of events and they run into a point where people aren't they're no longer seeing them as a philanthropical organization. They're they're kind of getting stuck at that coming to an event point and not uh -huh. moving up up that path or that ladder. Um, to to make a donation. And so um, then what we do is we start to talk to those people. And so, um, you know, whether it's work that I do or, or help coaching organizations to do this, we um, look at how do you define, you know, where those people are and who they are and, and talk to them. So it could be through one-on-one um, -on -one interviews uh, or surveys, uh, but really trying to figure out where people's minds are at and what they don't understand at that point in their journey. Um, right. You know, getting to those feelings, those emotions and the functional needs that I mentioned before. Right. Yeah. I think that's great. 
Um, so once you've established where someone is in the system, then you're, you make recommendations for the kind of the next, the materials that they need to get them to kind of hop up a level. Is that, is that the next phase of the, of your engagement? Yeah. So, um, typically what we can, you know, once we've talked to people, we can also get ideas out in front of people. Um, so in those same conversations, uh, I'll, I use, I'm thinking of a specific example when I mentioned um, that, you know, uh, an arts organization that was having people getting stuck coming to their events, but not moving forward. And so um, one of the things we did with them is we built, um, we prototyped some messaging. Uh, and so what we're really looking for is like messaging that they could say before their events that reminded people of the bigger picture. Um, and okay. what we felt might be right for them at the time, given the the knowledge of the organization. Um, and so we put together a few different messages. Like one was about the history of the organization. One was, um, you know, more about how the organization fits into the, the broader world. Um, one told a very personal story. And um, I'm now guiding that, that nonprofit to interview people that fit into that point in their um, in their engagement path and sharing these concepts with people and getting the reactions to them and so not not saying you know a b or c is the right one but hearing what they think when when they're saying those those statements and seeing right. if it's the right um right motivation to to then you know come in and say hey if you really enjoyed this you know we'd love to have you support um the rest of what we do with a small donation, um, you know, and they've making sure that the reactions people are having feel like they're going to lead people up to that. Right. Oh, that's great. I, I think that it, it's really interesting and that's data that can be pulled and, and, and essentially a list where you could, you could pull out people who have been to an event, but didn't donate. Um, and know that those people are are kind of in at least potentially uh, right in that sweet spot for for a a specific ask and then um, and you mentioned this in a LinkedIn post that you that you wrote today is in terms of testing and I think that that's one of the places where you know most businesses not just uh, those in the nonprofit world um, you know haven't have a real opportunity that that gets missed by not facilitating, you know, it, either AB testing or, or some sort of, of testing where they're, they're seeing what works best and, and then improving upon, improving upon that messaging. Yeah, it really, it feels like a missed opportunity. And I, you know, I can understand because I come from the for-profit world and, you know, people spend a lot of money on consumer testing um, and it's very, it can be very time consuming um, but what I love about, you know, just having a conversation with somebody or even new technology where you can do ABC testing, um, you know, and some some easy to do surveys, like you, you can do it affordably. It doesn't have to be a big, thorough, you know, deal to, to get some feedback. Um, and right. So that's really what I look for. Is how do we kind of find some quicker, more nimble methods that allow nonprofits to, to work it into their work so that they're not doing things the, the wrong way and then find out they spent a bunch of money that way um, versus, you know, spending a little bit of time ahead of it and, and really um, figuring out the way that's going to work. Yeah. Um, what are the, what are the mechanisms that you recommend for, for nonprofits? Obviously, <clears throat> you know, uh, most most nonprofits are very uh, very cost sensitive. What what are some of the the methodologies that you employ to to help uh, help get that data but keep costs down? Well, like I said, you know, a phone call and asking the right questions is it's something a lot of nonprofits are already doing, except for the, the really asking the right questions part. Going in knowing what you want to know and making sure you're asking a lot of whys. Um, for people, that's it's time consuming, but but affordable, um, and it doesn't need to be everybody. You know, you can you can 
do phone calls with a, a small amount of people um, and just start to get a pulse on what's happening in people's minds. Um, you know, using surveys, SurveyMonkey, you can put together um, you know, very short questionnaires that you could put in your email blasts um, or even pop into social media. Um, and um, in the same regard, you know, just having asking questions on social media and getting people to respond just to one thing at a time. Um, you know, surveys don't have to be 25 questions and, and ask everyone's right. demographics each time. But sometimes it can right. just be, what did you remember most about our virtual program last week? Um, you know, those kind of things can help you get a sense for what caught people's attention. Um, and, and then if, if you're really curious about someone's response, just pull them out and say, Hey, do you mind if we had a 10 minute conversation so I could ask you more about that? Um, and people love, people love to give feedback. Um, I, that was actually, you know, in the same line when I was uh, looking for some of those statistics I mentioned earlier, I found that, uh, a statistic that said 77% of brands are viewed more favorably if they invite customer feedback. And huh, that's, yeah, <laughs> you know, obviously that is for for profit, but you know, oh my gosh, what a great way to connect with your audience is just, just ask for feedback. It doesn't mean they're directing your programs or changing your mission. You're, you're just kind of getting a sense for where people are at. Well, what I also really love about that, and this is part of <clears throat> the way that we talk about, about marketing is is really it's just relationship building. And whenever you are in a relationship, it's usually, usually the stronger relationships are two way in terms of there's a conversation that's going on and there's, there are questions being asked and there's feedback and there's, you know, genuine concern for and interest in, um, what's being, what's being said. And I think that people tend to think of marketing as, as more of a, Oh, this is, this is where you get up on the soapbox and you mm -hmm. just start shouting your message. And, um, and what's neat about, about even just the survey piece in general is the first thing is it's another touch point. So we, if you think about relationships as interactions over time, that's another interaction that you've added to that, to that list. So you're just building that relationship. And then it's even strengthened further by the fact that you're, you know, hopefully genuinely interested in, uh, in somebody's thoughts and, and feelings and opinions about, uh, your organization or an event that you just had or what have you. And so it, it really goes a long way. Just, just asking those questions can go a, a very long way to, to reinforcing, um, this relationship that you're trying to create with, with that particular constituent. Yeah, no, that's a, a great way to put it. And, uh, I, it actually reminded me yesterday, I led a conversation around what, what is your audience thinking? Um, we're talking about different ways, uh, you can listen to your audience and gather that feedback. And I asked the group, um, you know, if they could reach into their customers' brains and, and know anything they could um, about their organization, what would they want to know? And I, I was really shocked, but that uh, it stumped people. People didn't really know what they wanted to know about their audience or what to hear from them. Right. And, and it did make me realize that, you know, there is a lot of, we're informing our audience, we're, you know, we're um, inviting them to things or letting them know about things, but, but engagement isn't always looked at as that two way street and what, what do people really um, not only want to hear, what do they need to hear? Because, um, you know, people don't just wake up and want to, to donate to an organization. They, they kind of need to know what's needed. They need some information to, to back that up. And, and they also need some help getting there. It's not, it's not the first thing on their mind. They still have to get their kids to school and eat dinner and do their own, you know, expertise in the work that they do. So, um, you know, I, I think it's sometimes hard to think about it as a two way street, but, um, it's, it's really helpful. And, and I say that because I think sometimes nonprofits feel like if they ask for feedback, then that is going to shift or change their work or they'll have to, um, 
not do the work in the way that they think is important. But how I look at it is it's you're really just getting a pulse for your audience and figuring out what they still need to know. Um, you know, you're, you're realizing what they might not totally get all the nuts and bolts of the work that you do, you know, how you're going to local elected officials and convincing them, you know, to build more parks, whatever it might be. Um, the, they don't get all the intricacies of that. And so you have to um, hear where they're at and their understanding of it and give them that little bit of information so they can understand it more. Yeah. And I think it's, there's a fear <clears throat> component to this that, that is, you know, I think it's, it's almost ingrained in, in us as people as we don't want to rock the boat. Um, necessarily. And, and if we're, if we're out there asking people's opinions, then there's this potential that that could disrupt that, um, that boat a little bit. And, and in actuality, I think if we come at things from a position of authenticity and vulnerability and, and trust, um, then we, we get that back and, and it's not something that we have to be, you know, afraid of that it's going to somehow disrupt this relationship that we've built, but it's it actually has the, the ability to, to strengthen that. Yeah. And, and you need to know how people are perceiving your work. Um, I, I was talking to someone recently about, you know, the term greenhouse gases and, and how, you know, he, this person is a scientist, was very used to using that word with other scientists, but, but he started to realize that like in certain situations he was in and trying to, you know, advocate the general public about, about the work they were doing is that some people just immediately had a negative connotation of that, of that word because of what they heard on the news or in politics. Mm -hmm. and, and so to take a step back and just talk about what that really means you know the the long-term effects and and you know rising heat or more storms talking about that first and then mentioning that those were greenhouse gases and then that's what it is um really helped lead that person um that he was having a difficulty communicating to leads them to to better understand uh his work in a way that you know didn't immediately get into that controversy. Right. Yeah. It's funny how, how language can get politicized, um, and, and completely innocuous, uh, terms can, can become, you know, very polarizing. Um, and that's where I think, you know, I love getting back to this idea of testing is that, um, you know, just, you can try things against your list where, um, you know, even if you just split test a headline, you can, you can see if there's a, a measurable difference in, um, in the way that people react to that. And, and you can do that in a non destructive kind of way where, you know, you're, you get happy with, with either one. Um, and then, you know, you can even test a, f a fraction of your audience if you have a big enough sample size and have and, and get data out of that that's that's uh, relevant. Yeah, it's it's a great way of doing things. And, you know, I think going back to your discussion about fear earlier, I think there is you know, it's, it's tough for nonprofits because they do have so much, you know, funding that comes from from sources that are keeping track and and. I think there is a lot of fear around, you know, being very careful with, with funding and money. And so I feel like sometimes testing in the nonprofit world can be viewed as potentials for error or potentials to make mistakes. Um, but I really think if, if you sit down and look at it, if you don't test, you could make a really big mistake. Um, and if yeah. you can do, do these smaller tests, um, it certainly doesn't, you know, uh, exempt you from mistakes, but, but you can make less of them and, and make more impact and change. Yeah. And that's what it's all about is expanding that mission and being able to, 
you know, if you can convert, if you're converting, let's say you have a, um, you know, a landing page for, for donations and that's converting it at 10, 10%. And you can then come up with a new concept and push some percentage of your traffic to the new concept. Um, you know, you're still going to theoretically convert at 10% on the, on the original concept. But, you know, if that new one converts at 15%, that, you know, now you know that you want to put all your traffic toward the new one. Mm -hmm. Um, but you didn't have that, uh, that idea even prior to that. And, and you don't have to, that's what's so great about, about digital media and digital marketing is that we can make those changes and, and change things back immediately without a lot of cost associated with, with making those small adjustments. Um, so, you know, I would encourage nonprofits and, and everyone out there to be really aware of that opportunity and, um, and being able to, you know, to, to run a test even for a few days, if you have enough traffic and you have enough impressions, then you should be able to, um, you know, be able to get some kind of science-based <laughs> data out of that, that, that helps you grow and move in the right direction. Yeah. And it's good to do that with, with things that maybe are smaller or things that you do more frequently, like asking for donations versus maybe testing your big gala or a giving yeah. Tuesday campaign. But, but you can use that information then when you do those bigger events, um, you know, figure out what, what it was about that messaging that, that did work and then, right. And then apply that to everything that you do. Right. That's, it's great. What, what are some of the things that you've seen working in the last, you know, the last year has been particularly challenging for nonprofits. What, what are some of the things you've seen that changes that, uh, that, that people have made that have, have really worked well? I think, 2020 really offered a lot of opportunity to reach out to people. Um, I think because there was such a loss of connection and, and nonprofits changing their events around um, and, and a lot of in-person interactions being gone. Um, I, I saw some great things where, you know, just even doing some check-in calls with, with their audience, making sure they're okay, um, really getting a sense for, what's on their mind. Um, you know, I, I think because what is the, I can't remember the term everyone used, but we're all in like, you know, in the same ocean, but different ships or we're, we're all kind of having these very different journeys. Um, right. During the pandemic, you know, I, for one of, I have a, a six year old at home and, you know, my life has been turned around in a very different way than uh, my friends without kids. And, and they've got, they've got to fill all their time. And, um, and so I say that is, is to to just do some phone calls and check ins and seeing you know how different people's concerns um, have shifted over the pandemic. Um, I also um, worked with an organization that did a, a mailing campaign. They had a they had an older audience, um, and they really mm -hmm. they, a lot of them were not able to shift to the virtual programming. Uh, that they were doing. And so they just reached out by old fashioned mail and, and put a, a mailer out that, that had a questionnaire people could send back just a really easy um, checklist. Like, do you want us to give you a call? Do you um, just want to lay low until, until next year? Uh, you know, kind of like a, a, what do you need from us checklist um, along with a little blank space for people to comment and, and that was just really nice for, a way for them to connect with people that otherwise they wouldn't have heard. There's probably still wouldn't have heard from. Um, right. And so really thinking, I think going outside of your normal ways of communication uh, really helped in the last year. Well, I think that was really great um, understanding of the audience where that organization that you just mentioned who, who had a, a, an audience that was perhaps a little less tech savvy and a little less digitally connected, um, to really be able to recognize that there was an opportunity here to reach them in a completely different way, going back to some kind of older, 
uh, older style communication that was going to work well for the audience. So, you know, really keeping one's mind on the audience is super important. Um, I think we, we tend to get in our, our own little space in our own, our own bubbles and think, Oh, well, this is, you know, this is the most economical, or this is the way that I would want to be, um, reached. And, and it's really important to take a step back and, and, and remember that, that we may not be our own, you know, ideal stakeholder. We may, we may fall outside of, of the ways that, uh, that those people would like to be engaged with. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I see that a lot, you know, people will, might just read some statistics and assume that, you know, no one over 65 is on Facebook or using email. And, and that's really, it's really not true. It's just less of a percentage. And so to really understand where your audience is, is important. And, and I think the idea of switching up the communication just helps keep people out of, out of a rut of, you know, everyone gets at some point is going to get too many emails. And so, you know, how do you right. think, look at reaching out to people in a different way? So it's, it's sort of this mix of like, what is your, what are your audience habits, but also how do you keep it fresh so that you just stand out in their sea of communication, communication from others? I love that idea, that concept of keeping it fresh, because, you know, I have found that not just recently, but but over the last year, people have really started to get um, Zoom fatigue. And so I've started going back to just regular phone calls, which is essentially, you know, the same thing, except for maybe you can wander around a little bit more. And it, at least in my in my mind is a lot more refreshing just to have something a little bit different. So I'm not stuck in a single spot. I, I can, you know, I can have a little bit of, of freedom um, that perhaps the, you know, that new great technology doesn't afford. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes when we run out of ideas, we can go back to the old ones. Go back to what worked yeah. <laughs> before. Just keep switching it around. Yeah. So what kinds of nonprofits do you work with typically? Are you, um, <clears throat> do you, do you have a certain, um, you know, sector of the nonprofit space that you like to work with or uh, size or what's, what's your jam? Yeah, I, I tend to work with smaller nonprofits. I'm definitely um, a lover of, of underdogs um, and helping, you know, really helping elevate them, uh, into the minds of people, you know, what their, their work is. Um, and because of the work that I do, I tend to focus on, on organizations that work, are, are really trying to engage the general public. So they might not exclusively work with the general public, but um, it tends to be, you know, museums, arts and culture, advocacy work, um, you know, people that are, are fighting for causes that, that need volunteers, advocates, and support from a wider audience. Gotcha. That, that sounds like a lot of fun. Um, and a lot of those, a lot of those types of organizations have really been challenged in the last year, uh, you know, particularly the in-person, um, entities like museums. Definitely. Um, yeah, that museums have, have had a lot of difficulty, but I've seen some really great work, um, you know, through, through programming, through, uh, Twitter campaigns, um, where, where they have done a really great job of, of advocating for people, but it's, it's still a, a big upward struggle for, for visitor based organizations. So I think this year is going to be a really interesting time for them because, um, they do have to bridge that the virtual audience that might be different, uh, from, from who they've engaged in the past, how do they keep them uh, engaged, but then also um, bring back, you know, the, I'm putting quotations, the old audience um, that, right. that loves to visit. Uh, so it's, it's kind of now, now I've been guiding nonprofits to think more about a dual path um, and, and how can they figure out how to move both of those groups forward um, right. and simplify it as much as possible. So it's not double the work. 
Yeah, it's it's interesting. I was just trying to come up with some ideas around museums and how, I mean, obviously there's very few things that, that will replace that experience of, of being in front of, you know, a famous, famous, beautiful painting or sculpture or, or, you know, car or whatever kind of museum you like to go to. Um, but it'd be interesting to see how to scale kind of create opportunities for vir virtual tours that then once you've created that material once you could you could actually kind of scale that so um you know you could do a you know a, a timed walkthrough of the museum to hit very specific parts of that museum that somebody wanted to wanted to tour and then leverage that material that you created for as sort of a one-off, but you could then, um, you know, just create this, this kind of reservoir of virtual tours, um, of the, of the museum in some fashion. Uh, it's just sort of something that, that just popped into my mind that might be, uh, an opportunity for those types of, of nonprofits to, to be able to, to get people re-engaged. Yeah. I, I well, and that's what I've found so cool is that, now there are sort of less limitations in the virtual idea, virtual world. So you can do behind the scenes, scenes tours that you would never get in person mm -hmm. or get like the actual scientists that worked on these fossils to tell you about them. And so I think there are some really cool opportunities, um, you know, some new experiences that people can have. Um, you know, I, um, yeah, the, the Field Museum is here in Chicago, and they had um, Jane Goodall come to their one of their fundraiser virtual fundraisers, and I just thought, how cool is that? Like, you'd never get to I see her in person, but to um, to really have that accessibility of, of virtual format. Um, but I think the new when I, when I think about an engagement path for these new virtual audiences that organizations have, I think the the new frontier is going to be how do you how do you engage them beyond the events and the tours? Like what's what's that next level? And do you, you know do you start to have virtual advisory boards or um, you know ways virtual dinners with like larger donations? Like ways that those same people can still go through that higher engagement process um, mm -hmm. without having to, you know, fly out to, to meet you and, um, and just open yourself up to more, you know, people who are just, whether they're just time unable to, to come to you, but, or they could, um, you know, they're not physically able to, uh, to meet you. Yeah. There's certainly a lot of opportunities that have been opened up by the, everybody kind of being forced into this virtual space. And I think, you know, some of the, some of the creativity that we've seen, um, over the past year or so, um, in terms of, of really, yeah, really just thinking out of the box, like, you know, yeah, it'd, it'd be fantastic to, to be able to have dinner with, with Jane Goodall, uh, sitting in a room together, but we can't do that right now. But in the absence of that, we can share, you know, that kind of, that, that kind of experience, we can create that, um, in a, in a different way. And it's, it's cool to, to, you know, have the opportunity to, to brainstorm some new ways of, of interacting. And, and I certainly think that, that it doesn't replace that in person that we all are, are, you know, well, at least most of us, I think are, 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 uh, missing. Um, but it, but it does open up some, some additional opportunities. In fact, there are you know, there may be people who, who don't enjoy the in-person, but, but would engage with a, with a virtual type event, um, that, that was scalable in that fashion. Yeah. I, I must say with, with two feet of snow outside and single digit temperatures, I've, there's some virtual elements I really appreciate right now. <laughs> um, but it will be interesting to see as, as in-person things come back. Um, you know, you, you're right. They don't, the virtual elements don't replace in person. 
Um, mm-hmm. But the last year, there hasn't been the in-person competition. You know, there's no other right. things that people can go to that are more engaging. And so it'll be interesting to see and and just be thinking through as you do virtual events over the next year is when does it, when are you going to be start competing with in-person events? Um, and so weighing those, what audience is appreciating the virtual event um, because they're unable to attend an in-person event um, versus, you know, how many people are going to prefer that in-person event exclusively. Yeah. And it's really interesting. I think that those two things can, can certainly live together. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to be really interesting. You think about the, you know, the music industry as an example of, of an industry that got, has, has been hit pretty hard given that they, you know, you can't really have concerts right now, but they've done some really interesting things in the virtual space. And, you know, certainly, um, you know, we want to bring people back into clubs and, and venues to, to watch live music again. But the fact that they've been creative and have managed to make interesting experiences happen that can bring people from all over the world into these, these events, as opposed to, you know, people who happen to be in Chicago on a, on a specific day, day, or can get to Chicago on a specific day to see a show. Um, it really just opens up that audience a, a lot, a lot broader. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. You bring music. Uh, my, my husband is a musician. And so we've definitely lamented a lot on the, the music industry over the past year. And it, you know, it just makes me think of like, when, when is anyone going to be comfortable being in a sweaty inner room full of people <laughs> again, even, even once it's safe. Um, but yeah, I, I think it, and, and so that is really, I think those complex questions like that, like, well, what do I do when I know there's these good and bad things about virtual and in person? Um, and this is where you really listening to your audience and knowing who your audience is, especially, um, you know, the ones that will most help you reach your goals. Um, right. Because I think it, it is really easy to, to just say your audience is everybody. And, um, because any anyone is able to care about you know the work that you do, but but ultimately if you don't figure out who most supports your your organization and and how do you recognize them, um, it will be very hard to get their opinion uh, and really understand where they are at, so you can make those important decisions. Uh, that's such a great great topic of discussion is the the idea of differentiation and and specification <laughs> yeah. in terms of of really really drilling down into who who you know you don't want to alienate people but you also want to become as attractive as possible to those people that are going to be most or who are most excited about what what you're doing and you know most many many organizations just try and cast a really wide net and and there's there's an interesting exercise that um, you can run on Facebook where you do actually get your ad to a place of of kind of good enough, and then you cast your net really widely and leverage the data that comes out of that to see who actually responded to that specific messaging. And one of the things that's nice about that is it's it's data collection that enables you to to kind of tease out who that ideal audience was for that particular message and then you can spend more on going after that ideal audience so you can kind of you can kind of take that approach and flip it on its head but at the end of the day it's all about figuring out who is that ideal um stakeholder for for your organization and making sure that you're getting in front of them with the right message at the right time um, so that you can expand your mission. Yeah. I I don't know what it is about human nature, but I feel like it's one of the hardest things for us to do. And I, I I have difficulty with it as well Is how do we, you know, not try to focus on everybody? How do we not try to reach everybody? Um, You know, it does feel like you're leaving people out, but um, 
you know, I, I think I posted about this recently where I was using the analogy of a puzzle. I had this very complicated puzzle that I was doing. It was 2000 pieces. So that's, it's like a, above my level. And so, um, it was just really hard. It was this landscape. And the way I got through it was I started to sort out the pieces. So I put things that looked like sky in one bucket and then things that looked like uh -huh. the ground in another bucket. And it wasn't until I did that, that I could start to see, Oh, like that pink is slightly different than this pink in the sky. And, and then I could like sort those pieces and then see the differences right. between them. And it was like this analogy for me that like the more you were able to focus, the more things you see within that group. Um, yeah. And so I think the same about an audience is, um, you know, if you can start to define a group and, and I, I really don't like the idea of defining by age or zip code or, or some of the demographics that we typically use, but, you know, defining people by what makes sense for your organization. It might be people who, you know, come to certain types of programs or um, people that donate over a certain amount and, and really seeing their kind of separating people by their behaviors. Um, mm -hmm. And, and then you can take a look at that group and talk to them, you know, gather feedback from that group and really get to know, the intricacies of what in that group, um, because they're, yeah. you know, everyone's an individual and we really separate it into it. What you're trying to do is just get people into enough of, uh, a separation so that they're, they're getting the information they want and need to care more about your organization. So, yeah, yeah, for sure. And it's, I think that the fear is, is, you know, fear of missing out mm -hmm. in that, you know, it, well, this person's willing to engage with me or this, you know, this audience might be interested in what, what I have to say. Um, and, and so there's a fear of missing out. But if you think about, if you think about your existing um, stakeholder base, right? And you have donors, you have volunteers, you have people who go to events, etc. And let's say you attach a dollar figure to each email that you have to send out or that you do send out. Wouldn't you like to segment that audience to send emails specifically to the event type people if you were having an event? If you have a finite budget and are really wanting to to you know make that spend go as far as possible, as opposed to spending more on um, the whole list or perhaps you know getting getting the wrong email into the or yeah, getting the wrong email into the wrong person's hands. Um, you know, and that's what that differentiation piece is all about is really just trying to figure out ways, trying to figure out common motivations, trying to figure out common interests that you can then, um, you know, fine tune that message to perform as well as it possibly can for that specific audience. Yeah. And I, you know, for, for those that are afraid of, of not sending that to, to everybody, I tend to advise like you can send it to everybody, but make sure it's targeted to some group within there. And, you know, I use the example of like, if you think about the last pair of shoes you bought, if anyone's buying shoes in the last year, um, right. Like no one just said, Hey, these are great shoes. Like they, they really, uh, right. um, you know, they either talked about how rugged they are, how stylish they are, how comfy they are, how easily you can wash them. There was something about it yeah. that caught your eye. And and if you try to message to everybody, it's just going to be ignored by everybody. So if you're going to send out yeah. that email about your event to everybody, make sure at least one group is targeted in there to really tell them about, you know, how awesome the, you know, the guest list is for this event or, or the, you know, the, the topics you're going to talk about that they're going to care most about. Um, yeah. I love, I love that approach. <laughs> it, it's like creating a pair of shoes that's going to work for everybody. It's, you know, at some point they're going to be so bland and uncomfortable for everyone because, you know, somebody has flat feet and somebody has wide feet. And, yeah. and so they're just not, you know, so basically all of a sudden you're just, your, your shoe is essentially a bucket and <laughs> like no the, one wants to wear that. The one and size so, all approach. Yeah. It's just not how I love that. <laughs> yeah. I love that idea. That's fantastic. I had a, just um, in talking about this too, I had an example I wanted to share for a, a museum that I worked for and um, 
they really wanted to understand their most passionate supporters and how people have got to be there. Um, and it was interesting. This organization had gone through a lot of growth the year before um, I interviewed people. And so they were, you know, really growing leaps and bounds with new members. And as I talked to these more stronger supporters, um, we started to realize that they, they felt like the organization was veering from their mission, that they weren't authentic anymore and they weren't, um, you know, doing things the way they used to be done. And, and it totally wasn't true. I mean, this organization just had like great research going on, traveling the world, you know, with sharing their knowledge. Um, but because everyone was getting the same information and it was really being targeted to this new audience that was more excited about the, you know, the Valentine chocolate event and, you know, the, the things that were for kids and sort of these more um, ideas that grab new people in, um, this more engaged audience felt left out. And so that that is an example of why you can't just message to everybody because I mean, if you take these people who had been involved with your organization for 15, 20 years and all of a sudden they're feeling left out, that is such an opportunity to, you know, separate that group and start messaging them with, right. hey, look at this research we're doing, look at the impact we're making, um, you know, in Europe and Africa and like like some really cool stuff that that you like have a group that really cares about that and you get to share it. Right. Um, but right. the wider audience would totally be over their heads. So yeah, it really helps to, to figure out where those lines are drawn so that you can get people that information they need to, to keep caring. I love it. I think that's just really sound, uh, sound insight. And uh, yeah, it just, it's not, you know, it's not that you have to be, excluding um but you're just really trying to bring those people who who are passionate about a certain thing you know give them something to continue to be passionate about mm -hmm. um love it i think it's a really good way of of yeah of people, approaching it. people are complicated but there's there's ways we can we can start to uh understand them and, and help them along the journey yeah, that's great. Well, how can people find out more about you or or get connected with you if they're interested in in uh, some nonprofit coaching or um, you know they they have a little bit of a lackluster uh, audience that they want to engage? Well, it can always go to uh, teenybig dot com t e e n y b i g dot com and. Uh, on there, on the bottom of my homepage, I have an assessment tool where you can actually test and see how well are you guiding your audience and get a sense for, um, you know, the methods and things that you're currently using, like how, where you stand. Um, and then through that, I have some different resources people, uh, people can access um, in order to, to better understand their audience. That's great. Uh, um, I encourage everyone to go check it out and, uh, and see how, how they fall in the, in that continuum of, 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 uh, guiding their audience to, uh, an action. So I also love to end my shows with, um, with the idea of action. And if you were to have people who've listened to the show today take some kind of action after listening, what, what would you have them do? I like to ask people to think about their, their audience engagement as a path. Obviously we've been talking about that this whole time, but, but I think when you look at your actual behaviors, a lot of times um, nonprofits will treat engagement as an interaction, like just a single point. And I would really love for you to, to, look at what in each interaction point, what do you want someone to do next and how think about how you can guide them there? Because then you'll start to see it as a journey um, and, and allow people to move up that mountain, up that ladder um, towards the goals that you want them to achieve. Uh, I think that's just a great thing for people to consider. And, and, and it is a journey, you know, there's, 
even at the end of that, after they've taken that action that you're trying to guide them towards, there's opportunity to give them an, a, a next place to go. So um, that we can always keep our our audiences better engaged. And I, I love your approach to that. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today, Emily. I had a really great time talking with you and learning more about your approach and, and hearing, um, you know, hearing how things are going. Likewise, Stu. It was great to talk to you and, and hear your ideas. Um, so yeah, I had, had a great time. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks, Stu. Bye. Bye. All right, there you have it. Another great episode of Relish This. Thanks for listening. If you would like to learn more about how to apply the audience engagement cycle to expand your organization's mission, there are two things you can do. Right now, you can go to missionuncomfortablebook.com to download a copy of my book. And while you're there, you can get your purpose-driven marketing score to see where you can unearth some gold for your organization. If you'd like to listen to back episodes of the show or sign up to be a guest, go to relishstudio.com slash podcast. That's it for this week. I'll be back next week for another great episode of Relish This.